Hello everyone, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Julie and I'm the one who organizes webinars here at the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. And before we begin, if you're new to the organization, what we do is we work with young women, mostly in college, but some in high school, to help prepare them for effective leadership in the conservative movement. And we also like to promote leading conservative women. And we do this through various ways. Um, Non-COVID times, we did lectures at universities. Uh, now we do a lot of webinars, as I'm sure is very understandable. Um, and we do summits, and we're still hoping to have some this later this year. Um, and then also we do intensive internship program here at the office. Um, so we encourage everyone, all the students that we work with and, and our supporters as well, because some of them like to watch, just to be active ambassadors of conservative philosophy, wherever they might be, whether that's on a university campus or in their job or in their local communities. If you'd like to learn more about us, visit our website at CBL Women, or if you'd like to get involved or apply for an internship program. And you can follow us on social media and that the handle is all at CBL Women. But mostly we really like to thank you for joining us today as we host Sarah Carter. Sarah Carter is a Fox News contributor and the executive director and founder of the Dark Wire Investigation Foundation. She writes award-winning stories for her website, sarahacarter.com. She is a national and international award-winning investigative reporter whose stories have ranged from national security, terrorism, immigration, and frontline coverage of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. She was formerly with Circa News, Los Angeles News Group, The Washington Times, The Washington Examiner, and has written numerous exclusives for USA Today, US News World Report, and Arut Sheva in Israel. Carter's work along the US-Mexico border has paved a new path in national security stories in the region. Her investigations have uncovered secret tunnel systems, narcotics trafficking routes, and the involvement of Mexican federal officials in the drug trade. She's uncovered the brutality of the Gulf and Sinaloa cartel wars, in addition, she has spent nearly a decade covering the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. She is the daughter of a Cuban immigrant mother and a Marine father who is a veteran of two wars. She is the mother of six beautiful children and is married to a war hero who was blinded while on a mission while fighting terrorists in Afghanistan. Today, she will be speaking on the southern border crisis and the current situation we're facing. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Carter. Hi everyone, it is unusual, I have to say, doing these conferences, you know, uh, in these times. These are extraordinary times and we're all getting used to it, hopefully not too used to it. I, you know, uh, many of us are, are coming out, I've already had my COVID vaccine and uh, uh, I think a lot of you out there already have as well, so I'm, I'm hoping for better times ahead. First, I'd like to thank you so much for hosting me and having me be a part of this, uh, of this group and being able to talk to so many young women out there who are aspiring journalists or working as well, trying to understand uh, the very strange world we live in. I mean, there's been so many fundamental changes, uh, not only to journalism, but just the way we live our lives over the last year. Uh, so I wanna thank you very much for having me be here and talk a little bit about the work that I do. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's perfect timing, I mean, to have me discuss the border. I just returned, so you know, from California, um, and I was covering a, bo a border story there, at, believe it or not, actually in the Antelope Valley. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up first is because you might be saying to yourself, well, the Antelope Valley in California is nowhere near the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, you're right, it's not. But what is in the Antelope Valley is an exceedingly growing problem with uh, the drug cartels, and not just from Mexico, but we're seeing um, criminal organizations from other parts of the world, uh, believe it or not, China, Russia, Low Ocean, um, as well, uh, growing illegal crops in what was once a very rural community, farming community, um, growing illegal marijuana groves in the middle of California. It's absolutely unbelievable to me. And neighbors, you know, are watching this happen and nobody can get anything done. Nobody can get law enforcement there to take care of it, um, especially during COVID uh, and when the police have been defunded in California. So Congressman Mike Garcia uh, with the 25th District in uh, California, his office contacted me made me aware of what was going on there. I talked to residents in the community. I went down myself. I just returned yesterday, but I was up in a helicopter two days ago overseeing with some of the detectives what was happening in this, uh, you know, in the eastern, it's actually eastern Antelope Valley 
uh, north of Los Angeles County. And I just couldn't believe what I was witnessing. A uh, thousand at least uh, illegal grows that actually looked professionally built. That's um, illegal marijuana grows. Um, one in particular had a crop of 20,000 last year, 20,000 marijuana plants worth roughly $30 million. Uh, some of the people that were working on these grows actually came out while I was interviewing the congressman and, you know, standing there uh, with some of the residents. They tried to intimidate us, film us. Um, the, there was one instance where one of the, one of the cars that came out of the grows uh, didn't want to be filmed and began peeling back at a high speed um, down a dirt road. I wasn't in Mexico. I was here in the United States of America. I was witnessing lawlessness that I had seen in other parts of the world happening right in the middle of the Antelope Valley. And I'll get back to, I was born in California, um, raised in Saudi Arabia, uh, come back to California um, during my high school years. So it was just kind of stunning for me to go back to my home state. And we've always dealt with issues, gang issues, um, especially in Los Angeles, in the neighborhoods where I'm from, uh, which is part of where I started as a journalist. But I'd never seen the cartels be so brazen that they didn't even bother hiding the grow. Um, I spoke with LA County Sheriff uh, Villanueva, who was amazing. Um, we, had a, we had a long conversation, um, and as well as Congressman um, Mike Garcia, who I believe is, is doing everything he can to fight for his constituents. And there was something that he said to me that I think is so important, and I want to impart that to you. And it's happened to me, I mean, I've been covering the border literally since I started my career as a journalist decades ago. Um, but he said, and this is the theme that I've been seeing over the last six weeks, particularly maybe since the beginning of this year, since I started covering the, the crisis at the border. The border is not, is not at the border. It's not the 2,000, roughly 2,000 mile porous border that we see. Um, it's not just there in McAllen, Texas. It's not just in the Tijuana, San Diego border. It's not just in Yuma, Arizona, you know, or the small bit of border that New Mexico has with Mexico. The border is inside the United States, the border crisis that it is. It is inside the United States. What I saw in California in Antelope Valley was stunning, but that's just one example. When I covered, uh, actually the opioid crisis in the United States and the rise in fentanyl, which we're seeing all over the place. And I think as college students, at least I hope that you've heard about this. Um, you know, especially the Mexican drug cartels and other cartels uh, from China, lacing pills in the United States with fentanyl. Deadly and absolutely dangerous. Uh, some college students think they're taking an Adderall pill and they take a pill that they think is Adderall and it's laced with fentanyl and they die. In Ohio, several years ago, when I covered uh, the story of the rise of the opioid crisis and fentanyl crisis, which there again is connected to the border, the Mexican cartels, the Chinese triads, the, the cartels, the gangs that were moving the drugs across the U.S. border. Uh, I saw so many young people, so many families, so many young people who were recovering addicts, um, and so many families who had lost young ones, who had lost their children, who had lost children in high school, children in college, children who, in prof professional careers, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. And the rise of this was so significant that the coroner in Ohio, when I did my documentary, Dr. Ortiz, she said it was so bad in Franklin County that they literally had to bring in freezers to contain the bodies because they didn't have enough room inside the coroner's office. The border is not just at the border. The border crisis affects each and every one of us. As a journalist, when I cover a story, I always ask myself, how does this affect me as an American, right? How does this affect the people, the story that I'm telling, the people in the story? 
what, what am I trying to get across? Am I connecting the dots? Am I seeing this from not only the, the micro level, but from the macro level? Am I looking from, from above, seeing what, how this affects all of us? And that's the theme that I want to partake to you. I want you to understand that when we're telling a story, it's all our story, right? The drugs show up here. A lot of people will say, because I'm a national security correspondent, you know, a lot of people that I talk to in the intelligence community and will say to me, you know, this is irregular warfare. The, the, you know, the amount of fentanyl that's coming into the United States, the amount of narcotics that are being poured into our country, the fact that we're, we have a nation of addicts, we have to accept that responsibility too. But the fact that other nations are so heavily vested and these cartels are so heavily vested in poisoning our country and the fact that so few of our lawmakers and others are willing to do anything about it I think they always throw their hands up in the air like, oh, this is hopeless. No, it's not hopeless. We have a crisis at the border and it affects every single one of us, every single one of us. Let me give you another example. I was down at the border. I covered, I don't, I don't know if you all see, um, it's, it's hard. I'm kind of looking just at like a, a blank box here in front of me. So I'm sure you're all there. Um, but I, I covered the stories at the border this past year. A lot of them are on Sean Hannity on Fox News. So um, I spent a lot of time in McAllen, Texas, spent a lot of time in Arizona. Um, and as I said, I was just recently in California. I also was in California along the Tijuana border. And I spent some time in Tijuana just maybe two and a half, three weeks ago. Uh, and a big focus of mine is the undocumented, unaccompanied minors. And what's happening with these children that are being trafficked into the United States and being trafficked through multiple countries without any guardians, you know, just hoping to make it. And I get out to McAllen, Texas, and I've done this before because I covered this same crisis under President Obama, 2013 through 2014. Um, I believe it was roughly over 63,000 unaccompanied minors were coming into the United States, basically, the same way they are now, except now the numbers are increasing exponentially. They expect over 120,000 this year. I expect those numbers to be even higher than 120,000. Um, and so I remember covering it then and I'm covering it now. And how that situation is exacerbated and actually perpetuated by horrible policies, horrible border policies. Um, policies and uh, narratives that suggest to the migrants, to the immigrants uh, and others that we don't have any rule of law, that once you get here, you're scot-free. Take the risk. And not only do they take the risk, these young people, but they're taken advantage of by the cartels, by the human traffickers. Um, and what I mean is when I'm in Guatemala, when I'm in Mexico, when I'm covering those stories um, and I'm following, I'm following the migrants or the caravans coming to the U.S., I watch social media, I watch word of mouth, and the drug cartels and the human traffickers lure people and lure young people to the country by using our own government's own words. For example, we saw that with President Biden. I saw that under President Obama with the DACA, you know, the DREAM Act uh, for young people. And the tragedy here is that it's not about not wanting more immigrants in our nation. It's about wanting to ensure rule of law so that we can protect them, so that it doesn't become a humanitarian crisis. There's nothing there is nothing more heartbreaking and more gut-wrenching than talking to young children, young girls who have crossed the border, who have been raped, some of them who have lost friends along the way or family members, not ever to know if they survived the dangerous crossing through the Darien Gap in Panama, um, where my friend Michael Yan is right now covering stories, 
or even off La Bestia, which is the train that brings people through Mexico, whether or not they live broken, their spirits broken, their childhoods robbed from them because the coyotes or the people that are trafficking them into the country are also perpetuating abuse, whether that's physical abuse or sexual abuse. There is nothing more tragic than to see women and children come across the border believing, believing that they will have everything handed to them only to realize that they had been used as pawns in not only a political game, but as pawns by the drug cartels and the human traffickers who are literally at times throwing them into the water so that they can distract our border patrol agents. Can you imagine this? Being a child or watching your baby, which happened in the Rio Grande Valley, having him thrown into the Rio Grande River so that the border patrol agents will go after the child, after the child, and not see or not have enough manpower to go after the drugs or whatever other contraband is coming in at another point down the way, miles down the way across the Rio Grande. And imagine now being the law enforcement officer that's having to try to save the lives, right, of these children being the first line of defense, and I've seen it myself. In fact, my good friend, Chris Cabrera, who is the vice president of the National Border Patrol Council, and he is an agent in Texas, has many times, along with other people, my good friend, Albert Spratt, I remember a long time ago, I did stories with, and others put their life secondary to helping save the lives of the people that are coming across that border. Whether it's a child that can no longer breathe, or like when I was down on the border recently um, with a congressional delegation, uh, and I, I saw this gentleman come across. I mean, he was the first people he saw was me and, and my, my crew and, and Chris Cabrera. And he had a fever. He was coughing. A lot of the people coming across, good 30, 35% is what I'm hearing. We're testing COVID positive, just coming into the U.S. And this poor gentleman with his two daughters had, I mean, oxygen levels literally at 72%. I mean, that's, uh, that's unimaginable. The guy was extraordinarily ill, this gentleman. And Chris didn't even hesitate. No mask, no, get him in the car, called people, drove him straight, straight to receive help with his daughters, with his family, with him in, that, in, in Chris's own vehicle because it was late at night and there was nobody around. We wouldn't have had an ambulance in time. Those are the sacrifices that are personal stories that our law enforcement officials make, right? When, when they are the first line of defense, the first line of defense for some of, of the people that are crossing the border. And now what we're expecting over a million this year, I can't begin to tell you the fear that, and, and, the, and the horror for some of these people making their way into the US. But let's just talk about the national security implications, right? The national security implications of not protecting the border, the national security implications of not doing what's right. Because we don't know who's coming in. And I can tell you this, as someone who has covered terrorism, I have covered the war in Iraq. I was there when the Yazidis were being slaughtered by Islamic State. I spent time a good portion of my career in Afghanistan on the front lines with our troops and covering Al-Qaeda in the region as well as the Taliban. And there are enemies of this country that will be willing to do whatever it takes to get into this nation. And when they see, you know, our society for the most part broken up and they see an open system with a porous border and our security pretty much taking last place. There is a good chance and a great possibility they will take advantage of that. And we saw that. We saw that happen just this year with, with two people from Yemen that were apprehended in San Diego crossing the border. 
um, and they were on the terror watch list. That was only the two that they caught. Imagine with Al Qaeda and sleeper cells, or you can just put yourself out there if you've studied national security, know anything about intelligence. There were probably others that came in. And that's something that we have to be aware of. I just saw that there is a question that came up from Oris Rentala. You said, we talk about the drug problem, yet our states are legalizing drugs every day. I live in DC and the people voted to decriminalize mushrooms and other plants. I grew up in the just say no generation. Um, I, I wanna answer this live. So I'm guessing I'm doing this right here. Um, I, I understand that. And this is interesting because when I was in California, I mean, that was one of the questions, right? Like people have, like, especially when I was talking to my producers, I would say to them, you know, you, want, you can't imagine what I'm seeing here. You can't imagine what's happening here in California. And they were like, well, isn't pot legal in California? And I said, yeah, but not the illegal grows, not the illegal grows. Let me explain. Imagine you're working for a cartel or like in California, one of the examples that they gave us was the Armenian. Um, there's Armenian cartels that have some of these illegal grows as well, not just the Mexican cartels. They've actually found Russians and by the way, a lot of Chinese. Now, not only are you undercutting, not only are you undercutting the legal grow, right? So you have legal grows. They have to pay an exorbitant amount of taxes. They're regulated so that the marijuana that would actually be sold, right, um, legally to the dispensaries, uh, you could say has been cleared, right? They haven't been using any weird pesticides. They've been growing it. It's, it's, it's to the standards that whatever, you know, the regulatory commission that is taking care of that, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission has, 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 has it put on this cannabis, it's regulated. Now imagine there's an illegal grow. Well, you don't even have to imagine it, it's there. 95% of the people working on this illegal grow are in servitude, are, are illegal, they have no recourse. When I was down there in California, already seven people had been killed, they found bodies in these areas, people connected to these grows. In fact, one man, according to the detective I spoke with, one man that they found who was killed was killed by the people running this grow because he had called his wife to let her know in Mexico that he had made it okay into California to where he was at. Now imagine $30 million from one illegal grow, right? And I'm moving that money overseas. I'm laundering the money overseas. I made 30 million that year off of it. I'm laundering it overseas. What am I using that money for? Could that money be laundered to be used for nefarious purposes? There is some investigations going on right now that even with the Armenians, um, some of that money is going to fund uh, efforts in their war. Uh, the Chinese have been sending money back to China. What is that being utilized for? Some of these Chinese triads, the money that's going back to Mexico, what is that being utilized for? This is an underground market, an illegal market. Now, can we, am I going to get in the debate if we legalize everything, is everything going to get better? I don't think so because we legalize marijuana, but there's so much regulation on the marijuana, so many regulatory areas that, you know, these illegal grows, if the law enforcement community, if, if they can't control it, if they can't come in and stop it, which they say they are going to now that it's been exposed, thank God. But if they can't control it, then it doesn't matter if it's legal because the, the people that are running the criminal syndicates, those organizations are going to utilize it to sell. They're going to try to undercut the legal operations. And that's something that I found really fascinating. And, um, and also, look, it's not just talking about whether or not, you know, just say no, don't say, you know, there are human traffickers. These, there are people that are being trafficked into the United States that are trying to pay back their traffickers, basically, uh, you know, pay them back for, for the crossing. And right now, it could be anywhere from 6000 to 10000 to $10,000. I mean, this used to be a lot cheaper. But they realize that people want to come into the U.S. They're charging exorbitant amounts of money. And some of these cartels and human traffickers that are working together 
are utilizing that to take advantage of people and say, well, okay, if you don't have the money now, go to work, go work for me, work for me where? In a, in a, in a pot grow, um, muling drugs across the border, muling drugs inside the United States, servitude and prostitution for young girls. You know, it's much bigger than just a drug problem. You know, I think for a lot of people, they think like, oh, you know what? I'm just smoking some pot. It's no big deal, especially if they buy it on the streets. You know, I'm sure that that's just the mindset that most people have. But remember the people that are making money off of this. They're monsters. They don't care about human life. They care about power. They care about money. They don't care if they uh, kill your children. They don't care if they uh, traffic young girls into the country. They don't care. Some of, I mean, for some of the children that have been raped at the border, literally before the crossing, I mean, some of them are very, as young as seven years old. I, I don't know how to express the, the type of, the type of uh, organizations, these, these drug kings, these cartels are, but there is nothing good about what happens there. And we should not have policies that perpetuate that kind of behavior. I believe in immigration. And I believe that some of the people that are coming are some of the best people, toughest people, willing to do anything they can for a better life. But we have to come up with a better system. We have to come up with a better system for that. Um, I know that I was going to leave this open for discussion. I don't know if there's a way to hear the participants um, or if they'll just be coming, but I would love to invite you all to, uh, to talk with me. Um, and I, I hope I'm doing this correctly. You're great. Um, we had actually several questions come in prior to this, so I'm going to read off a few of them because I'm curious myself. Um, but first, I have a question. Sure. Um, I think that we see so much in just the mainstream media and maybe mostly from like the left side of the aisle with a narrative that says, if you don't like this situation or if you don't think that this is an acceptable situation, you are a bigot, you are this, you are this, and they just sort of dismiss everything. And so the narrative that seems to be mainstream is that anybody who has a discussion or a point against the mainstream narrative is just a bad person. How do we combat that so we can actually talk about what are very real serious issues? How do we combat that narrative? I think that's a great question. It's one that I deal with consistently. I am, you know, the daughter of an immigrant, first born on my mother's side in, in the United States. My mom did come in the late 1960s to America on the Johnson Freedom Flights from Cuba. And I have family still in Cuba. And my sister-in-law is from Mexico. We talk about this all the time. I speak Spanish fluently. I spend a lot, a good portion of my time, and I love Central America and Latin America and Mexico. This isn't about this, and, and I think this is the way to combat this. If you actually love the people you're talking about, if you actually care about human life and human dignity, you would not use people in this political game as pawns to be abused and taken advantage of by some of the worst people on the planet. And I've seen it with my own eyes. I've talked to the children. I've, I've talked to people. My friend Michael Yawn, he's a great journalist. He's out there right now in the Darien Gap, one of the most dangerous places on earth right now. He's actually invited me to go with him and I, I may take him up on it. And, and, and spend some time there because I think it's an important part of the story that people don't think about. He, he had some people in the interview, people like I interviewed in Guatemala. I remember talking to people in Guatemala about this and in Honduras when I, you know, when I was there along the border and the caravans were coming across. And he said to them, would you advise people, that the people that you traveled with, would, if you could go back right now, would you tell women and children and people to come like you did? And they... And on camera said no don't do it don't come don't take this journey it's so dangerous so many young people have lost their lives in fact one of the babies that was with a group of Haitians that came through the Darien Gap just recently 
the baby was, yeah, the baby was killed. It, it died on the way through the Darien Gap. Girls disappear. People are raped. The journey is dangerous. And even if, even if that doesn't happen, children have, have died out in the Rio Grande Valley sector alone. I mean, the, the cartels, they don't care. The, the human traffickers don't care. So my answer to the people who want to call me or anyone else a racist for not accepting this is, wait a minute, I'm not opposed to immigration. I'm not opposed to changing immigration laws legally. What I'm opposed to is perpetuating behavior and policies that allow the drug cartels and the human traffickers to take control and, and be basically the welcome wagon to the United States. The welcome wagon to the United States should not be the drug cartels, should not be Chapo Guzman or the Juarez cartel or Nuevo Generacion or any of the thousands of gangs that are operating on that border who are not only trafficking in humans, but trafficking drugs, trafficking weapons, uh, tr we don't even know. Trafficking contraband, undercutting our economy, undercutting, uh, poisoning our children. They, to me, I'm on the right side of history. I'm on the right side of the issue, right? And coming from a woman whose mother had an accent, the thickest accent you could imagine, and a grandmother who came to America who it was in her 60s when she got here and didn't really learn English that well, and a great-grandmother who was born in West Africa, and a father who was from Alabama, and I think I'm just, a, my dad used to call me a Heinz 57, was his, you know, saying for me, coming from someone who really has, has traveled the world too, I think that when you stand up for human rights, when you stand up for and fight for other people, and, and from, from my heart, I do that. Not because I don't want them here, but because I truly care about their life. There is no argument that the left can win when you stand on that argument. They just can't win it. They just can't. They can't explain to me why it's okay for drug cartels to traffic seven-year-old kids into our country. They can't explain to me why it's okay for tents right now to be filled with 7,000 you know, I mean, seven, I'm sorry, 729% more capacity than they should be. You know, why children are coming here with COVID and why Americans should be exposed as well after a year, right, of being locked down and told not to wear masks, why we should be okay with the fact that people are coming in and not even being tested and $84 million is going to house people in hotel rooms that we don't even know where they're from. They don't even have documentation. It's a tough situation. It is. It's a tough situation. But we have ways of fixing that. And there is such a thing as law and order. And when you do that, you don't perpetuate that kind of horrible behavior. It's a long battle, I think, that we'd have to engage right. in just to talk through this. Um, it's interesting, though, because we did see such, you said you were doing this investigation work under Obama. And then under Trump, we saw a different situation, you know, come through over time. And now we're going backwards. And it's very interesting. Hope, do you think that will help people see what policies could actually be helpful and effective? Or do you think that they'll kind of disengage because it was Trump? No, I actually think, you know, facts are facts, right? If we still live in a world of common sense, and I have a lot of faith, I hope, in the American people. And you know, it, regardless of how anyone felt about President Trump, the policy itself might not have been perfect, might not have been exactly what everybody wanted, but it was law and order. And it, and it, it sent a message. It sent a me message to the nations that are taking advantage of us. It sent a message to the drug cartels and the human traffickers, sorry, no go anymore, no free gravy train, no ride into the United States. We are gonna protect the people that are on the other side of this border, and we're gonna have um, a system that will get them safely into the United States. 
Now, do we need to reform our immigration system? Do we need to look at it again? Do we need to find a better way of handling the Western Hemisphere um, and our partners? Yes, I think so. And I think a big point in that is something that the Biden administration is making a mistake in again. And, and I think that the Trump administration did a fairly good job with uh, is not handing out money, not doling out cash to nations that are not abiding their own human rights rules and regulations and, and taking advantage of, of, the, of the American system. You don't offer $1.4 trillion you know, uh, of money like this without having some responsibility on both sides. And I think that is something that is essential and something that we all need to do uh, as a government, as our government. And I think Biden failed that. I was over in uh, Tijuana um, talking to a pastor at a shelter. Um, he had a lot of children there from Guatemala and Honduras, little children, their mothers, um, you know, suffered quite a bit on the journey and they were waiting for the legal process. They were not at the Tijuana border hoping to cross with the drug cartels or human traffickers. These, these people were actually waiting, some of them several years, to process legally into the United States. But he said something that was very interesting. He said, do you know how many nonprofits and how many people, lawyers, law, immigration lawyers, quote unquote, nonprofits, quote unquote, are, they want the chaos, they want this so that they can get part of that funding. They, they're people taking advantage. Once again, you have the poor being used as pawns in a game for people to line their pockets. Not just the governments, but the nonprofits and others. Who some are good, but believe me, I'm I'm doing an investigation. There are a lot of them out there that are bad too. That are taking advantage of this. And that see a potential gold mine, you know, in these, uh, in w when we do this type of funding. So I think we need to hold people accountable, hold them responsible, hold governments accountable. And yes, I do believe in common sense. And I think that Americans right now, and we can see that, you know, um, out there, we can see what people are saying, what people are feeling, surveys out there that are looking at this, um, that what happened now under Biden is a Biden border crisis. I think Americans are seeing that. And under Trump, it was not like this. Really the last year of Trump being in office, we saw an extensive change. And even when the caravans were heading down here, I was in Guatemala when they were coming during the Trump administration, uh, they didn't, people didn't try. They just stopped. Um, yeah, they just knew. They knew they weren't gonna get in. Wow, it's interesting how they, when you know law and order and you actually feel that America has a sovereign border, it, it does make an impact. I have a friend who's, um, she works with bringing migrants into Canada. She's Canadian and she works in the foreign service there. And they take their border and sovereignty very seriously. And it's just not the same idea. And so when we talk about this issue, it's very interesting because it seems to be okay for them to take their border seriously. And yet when Americans sometimes discuss like sovereignty, you know, borders should be secure, we should know who's coming across. They argue, like, you should have open borders, and it's a completely irrational and illogical idea that you have to combat in the narrative, and it's challenging, let's just it say. Is. It's just, it's kind of crazy if you think about it, because it's like, we have law and order, we have a sovereign border, but then you hear the argument from the left, and I, this argument is a fallacy, but they always try to catch you on it, like on a human, they try to make it seem like you're not human, you don't understand. Uh, I have a friend from Mexico, uh, he's a reporter, Oscar, and he is phenomenal, he's in Tijuana, and he walked up to one of the attorneys who said to him, he said, uh, sir, I found out that some people in your group have, uh, his name is Oscar Ramirez, some people in your group have created fake marriages to get people into the United States, that some people in your group are breaking the law to get people into the country. And then the guy said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to address that. But don't you think, don't you think if people are being abused in their country that they should be able to, even under a fake marriage, get into the U.S.? Don't you think that if people say they're being harmed, we should just open our borders? Like he was serious. He was saying, he goes, well, sir, I'm from Mexico. 
And we don't let that happen here. At least we don't, our government doesn't. So why should the United States let that happen? And that's a really good point because they can make up the humanitarian argument and they could say, oh, we, we shouldn't have borders. You must be a racist if you don't believe the way I believe. But the real issue is, is you, they're creating a state of lawlessness and chaos and nobody benefits from it. Because when the people come in here illegally and they're trafficked into the US and they disappear into the fabric of our society, uh, they don't even have anyone to represent them or protect them. And that's what I saw when I was down at the Groves in California. Again, seeing the fact that the people that work there are in servitude. And if law enforcement can't help them, if a neighbor can't help them, if they're under the thumb of the drug cartels, then what happens? They're like that guy. He gets killed. They find his body. Maybe they make an arrest, but they don't catch the kingpin. Um, and, you know, somebody loses their life and they never had anyone or any recourse or no one to fight for them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's crazy. I, that argument is always, it always baffles me how I, it sounds like an argument that would come out of like, you know, somebody who's caring maybe in high school, you know, like, well, we shouldn't have borders. But until you realize, you know, at one point or another, well, how important the border is and why we do then you grow out of that. But that seems to be, that seems to be a non-common sense argument I hear quite often. Yeah, it's my worry that some of the common sense you spoke of earlier might be dissipating in certain areas. <laughs> I think <laughs> um, so. <laughs> and another question that came in ahead of time, which I really would like to hear what you may say to this. Um, when you say cartel war in Mexico, what does that mean? And what does it look like in Mexico when there's a cartel at war? Like how do they control areas? So basically the cartels battle for um, access into the United States, particularly areas like where we see McAllen, Texas, or Brownsville, Juarez, along the El Paso border, Yuma, Arizona, because what they're trying to fight, what they are fighting over is our transit routes into the U.S. Those are our highway systems. Uh, for example, Houston, Houston, Texas is a central hub where the cartels begin to distribute a lot of their narcotics. Sinaloa cartel, obviously the most famous one. Uh, Chapo Guzman is now being held in the United States, but Sinaloa is still thriving, very strong, very much, very much in operation in Mexico. There's a new cartel called Nuevo Generacion, um, and Nuevo Generacion is run by a man that they call the Ghost, El Menche, and he is, uh, you can imagine the kind of money these organizations amass. Um, some of them are connected to Colombian cocaine, uh, they've worked together, so across the whole border region and throughout Central America, going all the way into South America, they've built empires. And what does it look like? Okay, well, when I was in Mexico covering uh, during, I would, was this during the Bush administration? Probably during the Bush administration, covering Nuevo Laredo, and I, I wrote a whole series of stories um, a border series uh, that we actually won the national headliners with. It was a group of us. I headed a team. We covered it from the United States into Mexico. Um, one of the stories was, here we are prisoners. And that was when I went into Nuevo Laredo back and forth for months, in and out, um, at the height of the battles of the drug cartels. So uh, Sin uh, it was Sinaloa, Sinaloa assassins, inside the territory of Los Zetas, and Los Etas is one of the most dangerous cartels in that area. They were formally trained uh, Mexican military special ops guys that turned to the drug cartel um, and basically became their own. And uh, they're vicious and horrific. What does it look like? Uh, they have no they have no problem doing things that we would consider beyond human. Uh, whether that is, uh, you know, God help anybody who rats on them, who works for them. They will not only kill you, but they will destroy your children and your family. Um, the bodies that they found in the desert, mutilated, uh, left in vats of acid um, to destroy any evidence of their death, um, fed to the pigs inside the farms. Um, it, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail from the things that I've seen because it is really frightening. 
Um, and I've spent time inside those cities and I've been, I've been scared. I got to tell you, I probably was more terrified some, in Mexico many times than I ever have been, even when I was in Afghanistan and uh, dealing with, you know, the Taliban and, and the war. Because wow. the possibility of dying in Mexico, it's the most dangerous place for journalists, most dangerous place in the world for journalists, that Pakistan, and you've been, you know, war zones, but journalists in Mexico and, and the, the way that I call them monsters. And even when I'm in Mexico and I talk to the people there, or I talk to people in Central America, these, these are people that have no inhibitions, people that have crossed every line, people that are willing to hold on to their power no matter what. And when you start to take away from their money, when you start affecting their business, what they call their business, uh, you become an enemy of theirs and, and they will go after you. Um, I think that for people to understand what has happened in Mexico and to prepare ourselves so that it doesn't happen here in the United States, which is the reason why I covered that story in California, is that once these organizations, which have amassed all of these billions of dollars, and I've talked to people in the Defense Intelligence Agency, I've talked to people that work in the military and in the CIA about this. I mean, look, Sinaloa and some of the other cartels have had over what they call 100,000 foot soldiers. I remember somebody very senior telling me this years ago. That means people on their payroll, people on their payroll, they buy people in the government, they buy people in the military, they own people in law enforcement, and then before you know it, you don't know who to go to, right? So if you're an innocent person, that's why my story was called Here We Are Prisoners. If you're an innocent person living in your community, can you imagine if next door to you, was, you know, uh, a middle manager for the Sinaloa drug cartel. I mean, you're not going to, would you go to the police and turn him in? The police might be on his payroll. Uh -huh. What do you do? What do you do as an innocent person? You know, and will you get caught in the crossfire of their gun battles? Look how many people have died. I didn't even, and I wish I would have just gotten the latest estimate, but I, can, I guess since I'm here, I can look it up on, on the internet, right? And find out. But I mean, the death toll in Mexico... Mexico's drug death toll it escalates, uh, and their drug war continues to take people's lives. Um, right now, if I'm looking at the right numbers here, lives lost, efforts targeting drug cartels right now, just even from NPR right now, U.S.-Mexico efforts targeting drug cartels have unraveled. Uh, DEA top officials say, I mean, people are dying to more than, you know, and then you think about this, and this is an important number just for all of you guys to get an idea on this. More than 90,000 American lives. Wow. I want you to think about that across the United States. Overdose deaths that took 90,000 American lives last year. Think about that when even when we talk about, you know, the tragedy of COVID and the deaths of COVID, it's tragedy. But think about 90 thousand American lives due to, to overdose. And we have Narcam now, right? So we're saving a lot of lives, people that would have died if it wasn't for the fact that now everybody's carrying Narcam with them, you know, and injecting people. I mean, in Ohio, for crying out loud, everybody has it in their car, even just parents that don't have kids that are heroin addicts because they're running into it. When I was in Ohio this past uh, month, at the, uh, at the rally for Micaiah Bryant after her death, um, there was a big protest and a rally down in Columbus. Right before it started, right when everybody got over to City Hall or, this, or the state office, the state house, sorry, uh, building, a woman collapsed and OD'd in front of, she was ODing and a police officer had to run over and Narcam her. Um, so, you know, she wouldn't die. So think about what's happening in our own country. The border, and that's what I keep saying, the border isn't just the border, right? It's the crisis at the border is the crisis that we're all facing inside our nation. And that's pretty sad. Wow, there's, I have, I personally now have like 20 questions, um, but can you, um, can, you talk, <laughs> can you talk a little about what, what do you think, given your experience and your research, what can the young women we work with, what can they do to impact the situation? What, what is the steps forward? We need to protect first and foremost, 
our country and our own children. And as young conservative women, as young conservative women, as you go out there into the world, I think that when you come from that place, when you say to yourself, I'm not gonna allow, I'm not gonna allow the drug cartels to run my streets. I'm gonna fight for my children, whether that's in Chicago. What, why are we losing so many kids every day, not only to overdoses, but to gun violence? What about our own children? What about our children here? What about the children being trafficked? You know, we can't turn a blind eye to this, even if some of us live in more affluent neighborhoods. You know, even if we think, oh, the drug crisis isn't here, believe me, it's there. You know, if you get a chance, look up Heidi Riggs, and I did a documentary called Not In Vain, that's V-E-I-N, Not In Vain. You can find it at the darkwire, um, the darkwire.com, um, darkwirefoundation.com. So it's my, it's my foundation, it's my nonprofit. But you go there, you can see the documentary there. I did it as a nonprofit. It's being shown, you know, in schools and uh, law enforcement uh, as well uses the documentary. But Heidi Riggs lost her beautiful, beautiful daughter to an overdose. I mean, she was only 20 years old. From the time she first tried heroin, which she smoked it, because she met a guy and, you know, one bad decision led to another bad decision, right? But Heidi wasn't from, from a, a low-income neighborhood. She was a middle-class American who worked for, you know, the state of Ohio for the government. She was working under the governor's office. And she has a beautiful daughter and a son and a marriage and a great house. From the time her daughter tried that to the time her daughter died was 18 months. Wow. And those numbers keep growing and growing and growing. We have to be willing, and Heidi was saying this straight up, she didn't even know this was a crisis. She didn't even realize her daughter was addicted to heroin. She kept thinking, she said, even in the, in the documentary, and when I've talked to her, you know, I thought the spoons were missing in the house because the kids were eating cereal in their bedroom. Wow. You know, I never had this thought that my beautiful daughter who made straight A's, who was a cheerleader, who was this, you know, beautiful, happy girl was addicted to heroin. So I think for all of you who are out there, all the young women who are out there, powerhouses of the future, people that, that I, I, would, I admire and love and I want, I want to see you succeed, fight for your communities. Fight for your communities, even if those communities are not the ones you live in, because eventually it pours over. It, it spills over. It's a disease. It's a virus. And it's killing our children and it's killing our country. And as for the border, fight for human rights. Do this, you know, don't let the left take the narrative. Stop being on the defensive. Put them on the defensive. We need to be on the offensive. We need to tell the truth. As, you know, young conservative women, we care about human life. We are not going to allow the drug cartels to be the travel agent for every person that wants to come to the United States of America. It is not, that is not how we operate. They are, and, no, and don't be afraid. I mean, I don't, I'm not telling you to go to Mexico and stand up and fight the drug cartels. I'm not telling, don't do that. Don't do that. But don't be afraid to stand up and fight. Those guys are bullies. I have, I have a different situation, a different set of circumstances, and I've been covering bad guys for a long time. And they're bullies because they're wimps, because they're horrible human. They hit a point in their life, they're, they're full of fear, they're, they're paranoid. These are the drug cartels they, th and their leadership. And, and they do anything and everything to human life. Don't even allow them to seize control. That means when they're bringing people into this country, remember a lot of the young people that they're forcing or bringing into this country are going into our high schools. Some of those people are connected to the drug cartels. Some of them, like MS-13 members, have been sent here to sell drugs to your children. That's a fact. I'm not making that up. I talk to people all the time, Fairfax undercover cops, undercover cops in, in DPS, Texas Department of Public Safety, people in California. They're nefarious organizations.
that do not care one iota about you, about your families, about your country, or about the people that they traffic into our country. They harm them. And if you come from that angle, there is nothing, there is nothing that the left can say to, to counter your argument. What can they say? Oh, well, we want to let them in. No, because you're perpetuating that behavior. Once you start the flow, you perpetuate that behavior. All the billions of dollars that the drug cartels, you know, I actually thought they should have designated some of these cartels, some of them, terrorist organizations. I testified to that in Ohio. And Ohio passed it symbolically, uh, but it came, to the, it came to Washington. Unfortunately, President Trump is no longer the president. I seriously <laughs> doubt that the Biden administration is going to do that. But I, 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 I believe that we need to be able to seize accounts, follow the money, uh, target the laundering, and expose them. For all of you out there, write the stories, tell the stories, fight for young women, Fight for their right to be free and not in bondage. We shouldn't be in 2021 dealing with slavery in 2021. People should not be in servitude. And you know, when people think it's innocent, when you have an illegal working at your home or when you have somebody who's illegal working in the yard, you know, remember that there's a lot of bad people too that are hiring them. People that are threatening them. If you don't come to my house and work this weekend, I'm turning you into immigration. Do you want to get turned in? They don't have any rights. So when people live in the shadows, they just don't have any rights. Use the argument on human rights on every level and, you know, be a responsible person. And if you want to change the system, let's change it for the better. Let's make it better. Let's make better opportunities with conservative values. Let's hold Guatemala accountable. Let's hold Honduras accountable and Nicaragua and El Salvador accountable and Mexico accountable for how they treat their own people. And let's not dole out cash left and right that we could be spending here in the United States of America to help our communities, right? Yeah. How, many, how many kids in, in Chicago could go to another, can, you, can they go to Germany and say, I, I come from a gang community, I want citizenship in France, I want citizenship in Germany. I mean, that's what we're hearing, right? We're hearing it when they come in. Oh, the gangs are taking over my village in Honduras. Well, what about the gangs in Chicago? What about the gangs in Baltimore? What about the gangs in LA? I, it just, I think it's just time that we start using common sense and we, we start making things happen. Excellent. We are excellent comments, not the situation, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, are, okay. <laughs> we are up on our time. Um, I, I have to say that the one question we like to ask before everybody exits the webinar is, and I'm really curious about this one, what books have you been reading? What could help gear the young women to learn more so they can be more informed to make these arguments you're advocating for? Okay, so what books have I been reading? I went back and I read a book that probably none of you um, have, and I'm not sure if it's Oplato o Plomo, and it was by Jaime Kukendall who I know this sounds so weird, but it's, uh, it's about the drug war. It was under Enrique Camarena. He was his partner um, during the drug war and during the drug crisis. And I went back to read that because for me, going back to Mexico and telling these stories is about all the people who have sacrificed their lives fighting this war, right? That ne seems to never end and seems to only get worse. And, um, and Kiki Camarena, his son actually was a judge and in San Diego and later, I, I don't know, I think right now he might be a pros. I, he was a prosecutor and then became a judge. I didn't know him, but I knew the partner and I read the book. He died in the 1980s. He was the first DEA agent assassinated by the drug cartels. And uh, one of the first big interviews I did when I was out in Texas was with his partner. And he said to me, he, it makes me want to cry, but you know, when I think about these stories and how many people have lost their lives and he, I was a young reporter then. And he said, Sarah, you know what? Thank you for caring. Thank you for telling the story. Thank you for not forgetting. Um, and I want you all to realize that like I have a little bit of PTSD, I think from everything that's happened, but when you meet so many people that have sacrificed so much 
And then you meet so many parents who have lost their children. And then you talk to the children, you know, who are crossing the border, who've lost all hope. And some girls who have, you know, been raped and, you know, and, and you meet children that are sick and you see so much pain and you realize, well, this just can't go on, you know? Everybody's life has to mean something. And for those of us who have the strength, for those of us who can make things happen, let's just do it. Let's just, let's just be their voice. Let's fight for them. Let's do it the right way. And let's do it with conservative values. Um, and, and that's just a little bit of what I've been doing. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much for coming and talking to us. I feel like I have learned so much and I know all the young women have. And thank you so much for speaking and for telling the stories. Um, it's because of people like you, specifically your work, that we can know how to better address this issue. And it is something that we must not let go and we must address. So I really appreciate your time and just all the work you've been doing. And everyone, if you'd like to learn more, visit her website, sarahacarter.com. And also, if you'd like to look for that documentary, and it probably the other documentaries are there, are at the Dark Wire Foundation as well. Yeah. Yes, yes, we are at the Dark Fire Foundation. Thank you so much. I think it's such a great organization. I can't wait to just build it up and, and get young women to, you know, we're already getting our first group of interns this summer, so I'm very excited. Very Wonderful. Wonderful. We're so glad you're able to do that, and it's an excellent website for you guys to look into the, some of the things and topics that she's been talking about in this webinar.